Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Ram with the Golden Fleece. You might naturally think that this is the famous Greek myth of Jason and the Argonauts and their quest for the Golden Fleece. It is not. This is a Serbian fairy tale, as documented by Voislav M. Petrovic, published in Hero Tales and Legends of the Serbians in 1914. This is a rather odd little story, with features that will be familiar from other old European folktales, and a few twists of its own. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Once upon a time, when a certain hunter went to the mountains to hunt, there came toward him a ram with a golden fleece. The hunter took his rifle to shoot it, but the ram rushed at him and, before he could fire, pierced him with its horns, and he fell dead. A few days later, some of his friends found his body. They knew not who had killed him, and they took the body home and interred it. The hunter's wife hung up the rifle on the wall in her cottage, and when her son grew up, he begged his mother to let him take it and go hunting. She, however, would not consent, saying, "'You must never ask me again to give you that rifle. It did not save your father's life, and do you wish that it should be the cause of your death?' One day, however, the youth took the rifle secretly and went out into the forest to hunt. Very soon, the same ram rushed out of a thicket and said, I killed your father. Now it is your turn. This frightened the youth and, ejaculating, God help me, he pressed the trigger of his rifle and lo, the ram fell dead. The youth was exceedingly glad to have killed the golden fleeced ram, for there was not another like it throughout the land. He took off its skin and carried the fleece home, feeling very proud of his prowess. By and by, the news spread over the country till it reached the court, and the king ordered the young hunter to bring him the ram's skin, so that he might see what kind of beasts were to be found in his forests. When the youth brought the skin to the king, the latter said to him, "'Ask whatever you like for this skin, and I will give you what you ask.' But the youth answered, "'I would not sell it for anything.' It happened that the prime minister was an uncle of the young hunter, but he was not his friend. On the contrary, he was his greatest enemy. So he said to the king, As he does not wish to sell you the skin, set him something to do which is surely impossible. The king called the youth back and ordered him to plant a vineyard and to bring him in seven days' time some new wine from it. The youth began to weep and implored that he might be excused from such an impossible task, but the king insisted, saying, If you do not obey me within seven days, your head shall be cut off. Still weeping, the youth went home and told his mother all about his audience with the king, and she answered, Did I not tell you, my son, that that rifle would cost you your life? In deep sorrow and bewilderment, the youth went out of the village and walked a long way into the wood. Suddenly, a girl appeared before him and asked, Why do you weep, my brother? And he answered, somewhat angrily, Go your way. You cannot help me. He then went on, but the maiden followed him and again begged him to tell her the reason of his tears. For perhaps, she added, I may, after all, be able to help you. Then he stopped and said, I will tell you, but I know that God alone can help me. And then he told her all that had happened to him and about the task he had been set to do. When she heard the story, she said, Do not fear, my brother, but go and ask the king to say exactly where he would like the vineyard planted, and then have it dug in perfectly straight lines. Next, you must go and take a bag with a sprig of basil in it and lie down to sleep in the place where the vineyard is to be, and in seven days you will see that there are ripe grapes. He returned home and told his mother how he had met a maiden who had told him to do a ridiculous thing. His mother, however, said earnestly, Go, go, my son, and do as the maiden bade. You cannot be in a worse case anyhow. So 
He went to the king as the girl had directed him, and the king gratified his wish. However, he was still very sad when he went to lie down in the indicated place with his sprig of basil. When he awoke next morning, he saw that the vines were already planted. On the second morning they were clothed with leaves, and by the seventh day they bore ripe grapes. Notwithstanding the girl's promise, the youth was surprised to find ripe grapes at a time of year when they were nowhere to be found, but he gathered them, made wine, and, taking a basket full of the ripe fruit with him, went to the king. When he reached the palace, the king and the whole court were amazed. The prime minister said, We must order him to do something absolutely impossible, and advised the king to command the youth to build a castle of elephant's tusks. Upon hearing this cruel order, the youth went home weeping and told his mother what had transpired, adding, This, my mother, is utterly impossible. But the mother again advised him and said, Go, my son, beyond the village. Maybe you will again meet that maiden. The youth obeyed, and, indeed, as soon as he came to the place where he had found the girl before, she appeared before him and said, You were again sad and tearful, my brother. And he began to complain of the second impossible task which the king had set him to perform. Hearing this, the girl said, This will also be easy. But first, go to the king and ask him to give you a ship with three hundred barrels of wine and as many kegs of brandy and also twenty carpenters. Then, when you arrive at such and such a place, which you will find between two mountains, dam the water there and pour into it all the wine and brandy. Elephants will come down to that spot to drink water and will get drunk and fall on the ground. Then your carpenters must at once cut off their tusks and carry them to the place where the king wishes his castle to be built. There you may all lie down to sleep, and within seven days the castle will be ready. When the youth heard this, he hurried home and told his mother all about the plan of the maiden. The mother was quite confident and counseled her son to do everything as directed by the maiden. So... He went to the king and asked him for the ship, the three hundred barrels of wine and brandy, as well as the twenty carpenters, and the king gave him all he wanted. Next, he went where the girl had told him and did everything as she had advised. Indeed, the elephants came as was expected, drank, and then duly fell down intoxicated. The carpenters cut off the innumerable tusks, took them to the chosen place, and began building, and in seven days the castle was ready. When the king saw this, he was again amazed and said to his prime minister, Now what shall I do with him? He is not an ordinary youth. God alone knows who he is. Thereupon the officer answered, Give him one more order, and if he executes it successfully, he will prove that he is a supernatural being. Thus he again advised the king, who called to the youth and said to him, I command you to go and bring me the princess of a certain kingdom who is living in such and such a castle. If you do not bring her to me, you will surely lose your life. When the youth heard this, he went straight to his mother and told her of this new task, whereupon the mother advised him to seek his girlfriend once more. He hurried to where beyond the village he had met the girl before, and as he came to the spot she reappeared. She listened intently to the youth's account of his last visit to the court, and then said, "'Go and ask the king to give you a galley. In the galley there must be made twenty shops with different merchandise in each. In each shop there must also be a handsome youth to sell the wares. On your voyage you will meet a man who carries an eagle. You must buy his eagle and pay for it whatever price he may ask.' Then you will meet a second man in a boat carrying in his net a carp with golden scales. You must buy the carp at any cost. The third man whom you will meet will be carrying a dove, which you must also buy. Then you must take a feather from the eagle's tail, a scale from the carp, and a feather from the left wing of the dove, and give the creatures their freedom. When you reach that distant kingdom and are near the castle in which the princess resides, you must open all shops and order each youth to stand at his door. 
and the girls who come down to the shore to fetch water are sure to say that no one ever saw a ship loaded with such wonderful and beautiful things in their town before, and then they will go and spread the news all over the place. The news will reach the ears of the princess, who will at once ask her father's permission to go and visit the galley. When she comes on board with her ladies-in-waiting, you must lead the party from one shop to another and bring out and exhibit before her all the finest merchandise you have. Thus divert her and keep her on board your galley until evening, and then you must suddenly set sail, for by that time it will be so dark that your departure will be unnoticed." The princess will have a favorite bird on her shoulder, and when she perceives that the galley is sailing off, she will turn the bird loose, and it will fly to the palace with a message to her father of what has befallen her. When you see that the bird has flown, you must burn the eagle's feather. The eagle will appear, and when you command it to catch the bird, it will instantly do so. Next, the princess will throw a pebble into the sea, and the galley will immediately be still. Upon this, you must burn the scale of the carp at once. The carp will come to you, and you must instruct it to find the pebble and swallow it. As soon as this is done, the galley will sail on again. Then you will proceed in peace for a while, but when you reach a certain spot between two mountains, your galley will be suddenly petrified, and you will be greatly alarmed. The princess will then order you to bring her some water of life, whereupon you must burn the feather of the dove, and when the bird appears, you must give it a small flask in which it will bring you the elixir. After which your galley will sail on again, and you will arrive home with the princess without further adventure. The youth returned to his mother, and she advised him to do as the girl counseled him. So he went to the king and asked for all that was necessary for his undertaking, and the king again gave him all he asked for. On his voyage, everything was accomplished as the girl had foretold, and he succeeded in bringing home the princess in triumph. The king and his prime minister from the balcony of the palace saw the galley returning, and the prime minister said, Now you really must have him killed as soon as he lands, otherwise you will never be able to get rid of him. When the galley reached the port, the princess first came ashore with her ladies-in-waiting, and then the handsome young men who had sold the wares, and finally the youth himself. The king had ordered an executioner to be in readiness, and, as soon as the youth stepped on shore, he was seized by the king's servants, and his head was chopped off. It was the king's intention to espouse the beautiful princess, and, as soon as he saw her, he approached her with compliments and flattery. But the princess would not listen to his honeyed words. She turned away and asked, Where is my captor who did so much for me? And when she saw that his head had been cut off, she immediately took the small flask and poured some of its contents over the body, and lo, the youth arose in perfect health. When the king and his minister saw this marvelous thing, the latter said, This young man must now be wiser than ever, for was he not dead? And has he not returned to life? Whereupon the king, desirous of knowing if it were true that one who has been dead knows all things when he returns to life, ordered the executioner to chop off his head, that the princess might bring him to life again by the power of her wonderful water of life. But when the king's head was off, the princess would not hear of restoring him to life, but immediately wrote to her father, telling him of her love for the youth and declaring her wish to marry him, and describing to her father all that had happened. Her father replied, saying that he approved of his daughter's choice, and he issued a proclamation which stated that, unless the people would elect the youth to be their ruler, he would declare war against them. The men of that country immediately recognized that this would be only just, and so the youth became king, wedded the fair princess, and gave large estates and titles to all the handsome youths who had helped him on his expedition. The best sentence in this story is, However, he was still very sad when he went to lie down in the indicated place with his sprig of basil. It is a bit mournful and pathetic, isn't it? You know, a couple months ago, I made a compilation video of stories where the hero did the least. I will link to it on screen here if you're interested. 
but obviously I acted too soon. This is the story where the hero does the absolute least. His mother and the girl in the woods and the princess from faraway lands do absolutely everything in this story, and yet somehow he's the hero and he's made the king, and the story specifically mentions that he gave big estates and titles to all the guys who went on the galley and helped him on his adventure. Ah! This story also never mentions the identity or the motivation of the magical girl in the woods who got nothing out of this arrangement. In a typical story like this, you would have expected him to end up marrying her. I'm also thinking specifically of Peter Humbug, another story that appeared in this channel. But that's not what happens here. It's also hilarious that the name of this story is The Ram with the Golden Fleece when the ram dies in the second paragraph and the fleece is like never mentioned again. I admit, I love the bit when his head is chopped off. Not because his head gets cut off, but because it is so completely sudden and unexpected, and in that moment it seems so final. <laughs> to be honest, I laughed out loud when I read that bit, and without it I wouldn't be recording this story for you today. The book this story comes from is so interesting. It's called Hero Tales and Legends of the Serbians. Um, let me start quickly by saying that there is a lot of complex history in the Balkans and national boundaries have moved around a lot in the past couple hundred years, and there's even been some evolution of the term Serbian itself, so let's take all of those terms very loosely and understand that we would give more precise distinctions and definitions today. This type of generalization isn't meant to offend anyone. However, this book did have a bit of a political purpose. The author... Vojslav M. Petrovic was an attaché from the Kingdom of Serbia to the court of the United Kingdom. He wrote and translated a number of books on Serbian culture and language for English readers. It is clear from the introduction of this book that the UK had the potential to be a powerful friend and ally to Serbia. So there is a genuine interest and enthusiasm for the culture, customs, and traditions, and introducing those things to foreign readers. But there is also, I think, a bit of positioning taking place, a little bit of, you know, propaganda is too strong a word, but a bit of a desire to win friends and influence. I think this is especially interesting because in a lot of books of this type, someone has gone out to explore and to gather a bunch of information about another culture and bring it back home. There are a lot of stories and folklore that were documented during acts of exploration and expedition, and those, even I think the most generous and good-natured of them, have a hint of being patronizing, even if they aren't outright condescending to the local people who are being discussed. So here, where a person is gathering up their own culture and presenting it to a foreign audience themselves, there's kind of the opposite. There's an element of positioning. There's an element of elevation. Not that there is anything wrong with that, and actually I find it even more interesting to hear someone say, here's what is different about us, here are the ways that we're special, these are our unique characteristics. It's super informative, even if it's not 100% true. Anyway, this book is incredibly thorough with an overview of the history, culture, customs, gods, stories, songs, anecdotes, poems. In fact, Petrovich says that Serbian folklore is just like the folklore of the rest of Europe but epic poetry is the true native art form, and then he bemoans that it's impossible to translate it into English. If you are interested, uh, check out the link in the description below. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that I find it absolutely hilarious that the confessions generate as much commentary on a video as the story does, if not more. I love that there's this little group of people who do listen to these and then feel compelled to say something about it. According to my analytics, only about 20% of viewers are still around out here at the end, but you would never know it from the comments. <laughs> what I love most about that is that I can easily imagine someone who is new to the channel listening to a ghost story or something and wondering why all the comments are about the smell of baking bread or whatever. It must be a bit weird to experience, and it does contribute to the feeling that we're just a little cozy club out here. I wanted to say one more thing about this story, but I couldn't quite figure out how to work it in. 
But if you look at the mother in the cottage and the girl in the woods and the princess in the castle, you could come up with a kind of three-faced goddess, all the combined aspects of womanhood and femininity that jointly kind of push this dude along his path. But that also might be interpreting something that isn't really there. By the way, I did just grab a random example, but the smell of baking bread is just about one of the best smells in the world. Baking bread or anything with cinnamon, like apple pie or cinnamon rolls, amazing. And I just realized that it is my lunchtime. <laughs> if you like weird old stories or rambling confessions or off-topic tangents, you are in the right place. Subscribe to the channel today and choose notifications so you don't miss a story. Please also drop me a like or a comment below and let me know what you think of the story or the smell of bread. Thank you so much for your support.